to everyone on Facebook Live and hello to all our listeners on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. This is the Montpelier Happy Hour. I am your host, Olga Peters, and we have a very interesting show about data and privacy and why that all matters today. I want to welcome to the show regular contributor, Emily Kornheiser. Hello, Emily. Good morning, Olga. And I also have Ryan Krieger, who is a lecturer and assistant attorney general with the state of Vermont. Hello, Ryan. Welcome. And last but not least, attorney general TJ Donovan. Welcome to the show, TJ. Olga, thanks for having me. I've been to many happy hours, but I've never been to one at eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> well, we shall, to we shall toast at the end to, yeah. to celebrate the uh, the new happy hour in your life. We used um, to record later in the day and we had a cocktail of the week and talked about how it worked into the news of the week. And then we started recording earlier and earlier and it became more and more <laughs> ridiculous to even pretend that we were having a cocktail. So now because we did try that for a while. A it's happy hour somewhere. <laughs> it is five o'clock somewhere. Um, and we are all happy you're here. Ryan, um, would you please start, just so listeners have a baseline, when we are talking about privacy in the US, um, what exactly does that mean? What are some of the expectations we have as either a culture or legally um, around privacy? So I'll try to be brief, because that is, that is not really a, a simple question. <laughs> privacy means different things to different people. Um, fundamentally, when you are in your own home, uh, you know, your windows are closed, your shades are closed, you're in private, right? People can't see you, people, you know, you can do whatever you want. Um, privacy means, you know, the ability to act in ways out of public view, out of public knowledge. But in, in modern parlance, in, in legal, privacy has really come to be about data and about information about you. And really what, what it comes down to is privacy is about controlling or ha- exerting some level of control over how the world perceives you, about, about how the world sees you, right? We have different ways that we act at work or that we act around our friends or that we act when we're talking to our doctor or to our minister, right? Uh, we, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. We, we are allowed to show different facets of ourselves in different contexts, and part of the problem is today that as, as everything has moved online and everything has moved to the internet and as technology has advanced significantly, it has become, the, 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 the lines have blurred between these different worlds of us. We basically, I mean, especially during COVID, we now do everything on the internet, right? And every time you're on the internet, you can assume that pretty much everything you're doing can be tracked. Every conversation you have, every website you go to, every ad you click on, every search term you enter, which means that regardless of how private you want to be, there are dozens of companies out there that are also sharing in maybe some of your most private and intimate discussions, information. You layer on that the fact that many of these companies also share this information with the government. Okay, things that the government would never be able to do would be constitutionally completely invalid if they were tracking you in your home. Right. That would violate the Fourth Amendment. But they can buy a lot of information from private industry that they would never be able to access directly. And private industry would say, well, when you use our site, you sign a terms of service and you've basically agreed to let us do whatever we want with your data, including selling it to the government or using it. You know, so that's. That's just one slim facet, the data that is collected about you. Then you add on things like geolocation tracking, right? We all carry a GPS device around with us at all times, our phone. And it's never off, even when we think it's off, which means that that companies can know where your location is. It also means that the government can know where your location is. But also, people who maybe don't have your best interests in mind can know where your location is at all times. Um, then you will talk about facial recognition later on, but, but basically, you know, the ability to, to even go out in public and be anonymous and not be recognized, which you don't think of as a privacy thing, but it is a privacy thing. If you want to go to Montreal and have a good time and, you know, no one knows where you are, that's perfectly fine, but it's becoming more and more impossible to do that. And the problem is that the law has just not kept up with the technology 
and the norms are being kind of tread on left and right by businesses. And we're entering this, and, and what's happened over the last 10, 20 years is the, you know, the big tech community has kind of trampled over a lot of norms and coupled it with a PR push to kind of convince us that those norms never really existed or these are the new norms. And now it's too late for the government to do anything about it because that would break the internet and roll back technology and you can't do that. And so they just kind of like ran ahead without permission and now want us to just accept that this is the reality and there's nothing we can do about it. And that's something we think about a lot in the office and we talk about a lot in the office and it comes up during the legislative session every year. And, and this is different in the United States from the European model, which a few years ago um, actually changed a lot of its internet privacy rules. Is that correct? That is right. So not just on the internet, but data collection in general, they passed a uh, regulation and actually they always had a much more comprehensive view, um, but they kind of re- reissued a new regulation called GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, a very boring name, but a very important law. And it, it unlike in the United States, where in the United States, we have certain laws that cover health providers, right? HIPAA. No, it doesn't cover health data covers health providers. If that health data goes outside the health providers, you can do whatever you want with it. We have a certain law that covers universities, FERPA. We have a certain law that covers banks, but huge swaths of our economy have no privacy laws applying to them whatsoever, mm-hmm. other than like the Consumer Protection Act, which is kind of the general one size fits all law that, you know. Um, so we don't, we have a lot of areas that are not covered at all. The GDPR really applies to any collection of data to any business. And it has, uh, you know, norms that do not exist in the United States. One of the big ones is what they call the right to be forgotten. You can, you can go to Google and say, we don't want you returning this 20-year-old article about that time I got arrested, right, for, you know, uh, being a public nuisance or something like that, that I'm embarrassed. I'm a different person now, right? That's one of the aspects of privacy as well, is that we're allowed to grow as people. We're allowed to change. We're allowed to do stupid things when we're 19 years old that we don't want people to know about when we're 40 years old. And Not that's if you fine. live in a small town, but yes. Well, <laughs> well exactly. But, and, and, and essentially, the internet is now making the entire world a small town. Exactly. I mean, think of how terrifying that is. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so GDPR is much broader. And the reason, by the way, why I think companies, companies that do business in Europe have to follow GDPR or they run afoul of it in Europe. The reason why so many businesses, why you heard GDPR, we've all heard of GDPR, is because the penalty provision in GDPR for violation is up to 40 million euro. I don't know what the exchange rate is right now. 40 million euro or 4% of the company's global annual revenues for the previous years, not profit, revenue, all the money they brought in for the previous years. This was a penalty that was obviously created for these giant multi-trillion dollar tech companies that 40 million euros is, is nothing to. And, 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 and that penalty, which by, they've never issued a penalty anywhere near that in the last two years, but obviously it scared a lot of people and made a lot of people talk about it. Thank you, Ryan. Um, Emily, before I go to TJ, any questions? No, I'd love to just hear about sort of how we imagine this in the context of tiny Vermont, because I know we've done a lot of really good work on this. Um, And I think, TJ, your office has done a great job of thinking about consumer protection much more broadly than um, random people might be thinking about it. Yeah, no, th- thank you, uh, Representative Kornheiser. Thank you for your work on, on the issues of pr- privacy and consumer protection. And Olga, great to be with you. And uh, we're lucky to have uh, my colleague, Ryan Krieger, because he's really not only a subject matter expert on the issues of, of privacy, but um, certainly in Vermont, but uh, I would say nationally as well. And I think Vermont, with uh, the great work by the legislature, with uh, Representative Kornheiser, we really have carved out a space about advocating for privacy rights in this online world. And I think Ryan really talked about it where he talked, you know, when we talk about privacy, you know, generally, you know, 20 years ago, we would hear a phrase of, you know, well, a reasonable expectation of privacy. And as Ryan talked about privacy uh, in your home, uh, on your person, and kind of that Fourth Amendment jurisdiction that I think we all understood and perhaps did not know the, um, to find legal print, but knew the, the, the themes 
about what that expectation of privacy meant in terms of, um, as Ryan said, the ability to walk uh, anonymously down the street or, or to travel um, and these constitutional provisions. And I think in Vermont, we had and still have uh, a proud tradition and we value people's privacy. I think that is a value of our state. And the question now is, how do you create and protect privacy rights in an online global economy? And what Ryan really was talking about when we talk about the Fourth Amendment, you talk about government surveillance, well, you need a warrant. But now we're dealing with business surveillance mm -hmm. because it, pe companies are making money off our data. And data is a now is now a commodity. We know that. And this issue of how people obtain data uh, is a is a threshold a threshold issue that we're now grappling with. Vermont, because of the leadership of Representative Kornheiser and others and the advocacy of uh, Ryan Krieger and Chris Curtis and others in my shop, uh, passed the first in the nation law about the data broker bill, which basically said this, said this, this crazy world that operates behind the scenes that nobody knows about, where there is an economy of third party data brokers that buy and sell consumers data. And here's the thing. We never hear about it. We never hear about it. It's this marketplace that exists that nobody knows about. And we think, uh, and I know the Vermont legislature believes this, uh, that people have a right to know who's buying and selling my data. This is my personal information. And we have a right to know. So we passed a law, First of the Nation, data broker law, that essentially creates a registry and people have to certify that they're a data broker and following the rules. And we have come up on this issue a couple of times. We just sued, um, what is it, Ryan, about Clearview nine months AI. ago? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mark. Uh, clear, a company called Clearview AI uh, that basically had a company, uh, has a company uh, that would screen scrape billions of images, your images, Vermont's images, our children's images off of social media sites. And issue about whether or not that, that's allowed, I think is debatable based on the terms of service that we all kind of click the box, which is a whole other issue mm -hmm. in terms of consumer rights about clicking that box um, and would take those images. And that was thing one. But thing two was they then would apply uh, facial recognition software to these images without our knowledge, without our consent. And then third would sell them to who knows where. Now they'd say, well, just would go to law enforcement. That becomes an issue, but that wasn't the case. And so particularly when you're talking about our children who now live in this online world and Ryan talked about the GDPR and the right to be forgotten, we don't have that protection in Vermont. So you are not, and, and facial recognition, I'll, Ryan's more of an expert in this, this is intrusive. And that right to be anonymous, that's gone. So when you're walking down the street, and 10 years ago, perhaps, you know, from the naked eye, somebody couldn't recognize you and law enforcement wouldn't know you. Now, because we live in this surveillance world, we know who you are. We know where you are at what particular time. And not only that day, but I can track you for the last seven days, the last 30 days, and perhaps even longer than that. And when you drill into that, I believe that is a violation of our privacy rights. So, uh, you know, th this is a big issue uh, when when we talk about privacy, when we talk about data. And and if, can I just jump in for one second? Yeah. If, yeah. So if listeners want to learn more about Clearview, there's actually been some really good um, exposés in the New York Times about it and a few podcasts, sort of much longer length um, exposés around Clearview. This whole idea of facial recognition. Um, I think we could spend some time talking about sort of the bias that's coded into all of these softwares and the implications for that beyond just our privacy violation, but sort of another layer of civil rights violation that happens there. Um, there's a film that's being screened in Vermont right now, um, virtually called Coded Bias that folks can find with a quick Google. It's a pretty incredible film. It's about an hour and 40 minutes. Um, watched it with my teenager. It's very understandable. And so Opportunities to really learn more about this because as TJ said, we really all just click. 
And it's really hard to live in this world without just clicking. I do it all the time, even though I feel like I um, have learned a lot about this thanks to the attorney general's office. Um, but in order to get along, you need to consent. And so the boundaries of what that consent means is something that we really need to pull in on legally because as in, when it becomes just an individual choice, it's a very difficult thing to opt in or out of and still live in this wider world of Zoom and social media. Um, Thank you, Emily. I'd love to talk about the right to be forgotten a little bit because I think it's a really interesting edge and it's one that, um, you know, I think journalists grapple with and I think we grapple with individually and I think it's something that um, is really relatable for people in a way that this sort of big data um, 1984 governments watching you is just like very overwhelming and terrifying, but right to be forgotten, I think is, um, well, Deepin has a catchy little slogan. So can we dive into that a little bit for a second? Sure. Uh, you, um, so think about, um, think of one of the big, uh, you know, privacy uh, data collection regimes that actually is regulated in the United States is around credit reporting agencies. Okay, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Uh, these are companies that were, these were the data brokers before data brokers were data brokers. These guys have been collecting information about us for about a century, really. Um, and Fair Credit Reporting Act says that they can't collect data on you or keep data on you that's older than seven years old. Their, their data collection about you, about all of your financial practices can only go back seven years, except for bankruptcies, which can go back 10 years, okay? So it acknowledges that we change over time and we should not have really, you know, after a certain amount of time, things should be forgotten. Um, and this notion, it's, it's biblical. I mean, it goes back, you know, the thousands of years, the idea that we, we change as people, the idea that your, your criminal record can be expunged after a certain period of time. The idea that things you, you do in your youth should not be able to be brought back against you when you're an adult. So this is not a new concept. I mean, it's more a codification of an older concept. And of course, and it, and it addresses the idea that online, it is now actually possible to keep this information forever. And this is another concept that comes up in privacy and it gets a little bit hidden in the debate. And, but there's one area that, that comes up in privacy is this notion of obscurity, okay? Um, there could be an article written about you in the New York Times saying all sorts of things about how awful you are and whatever. And 30 years ago, that article would still exist. It would be in a book somewhere, in an archive or on microfiche in a library. Mm -hmm. And no one could access it, right? Unless they were specifically looking for it. And so even though it was out there, it was public information about you, it was obscure. Or there could be information about your birth date and when you got married and all sorts of other information in some city clerk's uh, filing cabinet somewhere. And it was public, but it was obscure. So now what the data brokers have done is they've said, well, this information's all public. So we should be able to collect it into a single database and make it immediately available to anybody. And this is a big fight we have in the legislature where we say, well, now, wait a minute. That was never the intent. Like public doesn't mean broadcast to everybody 24 mm seven. -hmm. That was never the intention, but that's the world we're in now. So the right to be forgotten is trying to kind of claw that back a little bit and saying, now, wait a minute, maybe information of a certain year old should be forgotten. Now in the United States, that runs into the First Amendment. So we have, you know, the, the one thing we can say about the United States is we have the strongest First Amendment protections in the world. I think I can say that pretty, pretty uh, uh, confidently, right? We extend First Amendment protections to things some people think it even shouldn't be <laughs> extended to. Um, so, uh, you know, one aspect would be Google, right? Should, should a Google search be able to come back with something 20 years old? Uh, that should be forgotten. But then some people say, well, now, wait a minute, if we talk about right to be forgotten, does that mean the New York Times has to delete that article that's 20 years old? And we haven't really had this debate here because it's never really gotten past square one. Everyone's kind of thought, I, I think, and, you know, First Amendment, we don't really, like, we, we want to we hit, like, kind of the more baseline stuff before we even get there. 
But it's, it's, a, it's an important concept and one that we should be talking about. I think it's a really interesting balance because when we think about, you know, especially newspapers of record, but any of this, I think journalists go into their work thinking on some level that they're recording history. There's sort mm-hmm. of the current events aspect of it. But there's the recording of history and how powerful and important that is. And at the same time, I know that a few newspapers have voluntarily opted in to this right to be forgotten and you can appeal to them to be taken mm. off their web browser. I don't know, have any of the right words for this, but to not sort of return results there, even though they're still saving it in some other location. And, but it's hard for me to get my head around how we would sort of um, create a legal framework to define obscure, right? Like I, even though that seems like what we're trying, what would be helpful. Well, and I would just add before TJ or Ryan jump in on that, you know, one thing some of the reporters I have talked to grapple with is, let's face it, it would be much easier with someone with, for re, with resources and access to big legal teams to exercise some of these rights mm. more than someone with less resources. Mm-hmm. And so it can become also a class issue yeah. with who gets to be forgotten yeah. and who doesn't. Um, And then the other thing reporters sometimes grapple with, too, is, yeah, at 19, you do something stupid and you have the right to change and grow. But what if that 19 year old episode is is a pattern Mm -hmm. and now you're a governor of a state and you're doing nefarious stuff? You know, so it's it's that sometimes what people grapple with as well. Yeah, I, Olga, I just, I, I think the issue of equity is incredibly important here. And I, I think, and we touched on it a little bit earlier too, with the problems with facial recognition. Um, but I just want to touch on one, look, I think the GDPR is great. And I think California um, it obviously hasn't gone that far, but probably, uh, I mean, Ryan can talk about it um, with the California law. But I just want to talk, talk on this issue of, you know, mistakes made, um, uh, from, from people and h- how we tend to have this now digital scarlet letter on, on people. And I'm troubled by that. I, I, it really troubles me. And I think equity um, is a, a factor that plays into that, frankly, especially when you're talking about the criminal justice system. And you talk about the issue of expungement. I'm a big believer of, of expungements. I, I don't, I, I think we have over-criminalized um, so many people, uh, not only in Vermont, in this nation, mostly the poor and mostly people of color. And that's created a, 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 a subclass who we've marginalized in the name of public safety and that hasn't worked. Now you take, now, now, now take the digital economy and put that on top of these inequities. And when you go to a job interview, Even if you've had your record expunged, which by law, a letter goes out from the court telling all the public agencies, destroy, literally destroy your records because an expungement is to wipe clean and as if it never happened. That's the language in the law. But you can't reconcile that with the digital world. And there's a, there, there is a degree of unfairness. With Absolutely. That. And employers, you know, are not allowed to ask about family makeup or all these questions in an interview or even in a reference check, but are free to look at someone's Facebook profile, Google their background, all of that before making any hiring decisions. And there's a real disconnect between what we've sort of set up as laws and norms and what behavior looks like. And yeah, that's exactly right. And, and it, is, it is hard to regulate that, right? We, we know what the laws are in terms of that face-to-face interview, mm-hmm. or I should say now that remote interview, mm-hmm. but it exactly you talked about, Emily. We have a right to go on the Facebook or Google and perhaps not disclose, uh, but gather information that you may make a decision based on or that move, may influence. To move further into this world of AI, we know that a lot of employers now, especially in our area, most of the big corporate employers are employing mostly low income folks. So if we look at hiring for any big corporation, whether that's sort of Walmart or Target or Brugger's, so much of the hiring for that happens entirely online. The applications get screened by AI before they get screened by an individual. And 
it would be very easy to build in also some extra web scraping into that with whatever names are there. And we know that what turns up might just be you know, related to that person's name and not actually that individual. In addition to the privacy invasion, so much right. goes wrong when we're just depending on AI rather than individuals. Yeah, actually I, some, oh, sorry, go on, teacher. No, no, I was just going to kick it over to you, Ryan, because I think, and again, um, I'm not going to use the right words on this, but when we talk about AI and, and uh, other types of software, it goes back, and I think you touched on this, who's writing that? Who writes the code? Uh, who develops it? And has it been validated, if that's the correct word, to, to make sure that it's impartial, that it's fair, uh, that, it, that it addresses. And you, 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 I keep going back to this issue of the world that has existed um, is now at the, the click of a button. And in the past, as you said, you'd have to go to the library and pull that microfiche and who, who's going to do that? And I, I I, it's I'm a certain really, skill set to do that kind of research, <laughs> basically. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I just think that um, from a very fundamental uh, value of privacy, uh, of respect of individuals, uh, we're not who we are, who we were 20 years ago, 30 years ago. We have, a, we have a right to change. We have a right to mature. We have a right to be whoever we want to be, not to be defined by some digital record um, uh, decades ago. Um, um, it, that's going to hurt our job prospects, hurt our employment prospects, hurt our ability to live our life to the fullest. And uh, yes, does, do we bump up against our laws? Absolutely. But Ryan can talk about it more about the AI. And, I, I, and I'd, I'd love to clarify sort of a specific question for Ryan on this. It's that, so yes, the individual programmer and their bias comes into it. Um, but when we think about sort of our ability as individuals to evolve, we also like to think of our communities of the justice ability to evolve, right? And that the bias that was baked into our justice system five years ago, we are hypothetically moving beyond. I'm not sure that's true, but I can at least hope for it um, as a member of the public. But when we are doing, when we're using AI, it's not programmed by an individual, it's programmed by big buckets of data, right, Ryan? And so the bias of people's past behavior or past mistakes then gets coded into future decisions, which is just. Yeah, so, so just, to, just to back up a little bit about, you know, when we talk about AI in this context, first off, we're not talking about, you know, machines att attaining sentience and Terminator and all that other stuff. People sometimes freak out when they hear, you know, what is AI? Really what AI means in this context is taking these massive sets of data that were not attainable 20 years ago. Right? There wasn't even the storage to hold them or process them 20 years ago. Massive sets of data, you feed them into very complicated algorithms and you come up with what they call predictive analytics, right? It, it draws conclusions from these, this data. Now, are these conclusions accurate? Are they, you know, maybe they're accurate 99% of the time, but the, nothing's 100% accurate. You can't tell the future. So that's one issue is that these often might not be correct, uh, completely correct uh, um, predictions. And then businesses have become using them again and again and, and more frequently to make decisions. And really, we're all acquainted with, with, with one predictive analytic, which is the FICO score. Okay, all the FICO score you, that, that your credit reporting agency gives you is, it's a single number that guesses how likely you are to pay your bills on time. That's all it is. It's just an, an analytic. It's a score. Um, and what's interesting about that analytic is that it's probably the most transparent analytic we know. We know exactly, we know how to manipulate the FICO score at this point because laws came in and said, you have to tell us a lot about how this thing works. In fact, we even now adjust our own behavior. Think about that. We like open credit cards when we're 18 to start a credit history to manipulate this score that, you know, some other companies have created to, you know, tell the future about us. But the problem is that in addition to FICO, there are hundreds, dozens, however many other scores. There are scores that say how brand loyal you are. There are scores that say how much of a risk taker you are. Are, are you likely to get addicted to gambling? Uh, are you forgetful? You know, are you conservative? Are you liberal? There's all this scoring about us. There's no transparency. We don't know where the information is coming from to create it. We don't know how accurate it is. We don't know who it's being sold to, and we don't know what uses it's being used for. In going back to GDPR briefly, one element of GDPR is actually a prohibition 
on completely relying on an algorithm to make a decision about you, okay? So if you think about, again, back to that FICO score, if a business decides not to extend you a loan or a, a landlord decides not to rent to you because of your FICO score, they are required to disclose the FICO score and tell you where they got that FICO score from. So you can go back and say, well, wait, what did you tell them about me? Maybe I need to correct the record. All these other scores, they're allowed to make decisions about you and you never even know they've used the decision in the first place, much less be able to go back to the original company and correct the information. But then we talk about those data sets and yes, the data sets that, that, that feed the algorithms, that form the algorithms in the first place, are often biased to begin with. And, and one example I've seen come up with again and again is there was a, uh, a product that was created for the court systems uh, to assist the judges in determining whether or not to make a bail designation. And from a judge point of view, this would be great, right? Because if, if you're a, a thoughtful judge, you might say, well, I have biases, right? And I don't want my biases to creep in. So wouldn't it be great if a computer could spit out a number and tell me this person should get bail, this person is it, it's a predictor of recidivism, this person you know, is likely uh, you know, to, to, to show up for trial, and this person is not. It's and math, now, and so it must be objective. And so we should exactly. do that rather than the vagaries of a judge and their life and their perceptions. Exactly. And so what is the data that feeds in? Well, it, the data is based on, well, who tends to show up for trial? Who tends to get a high, higher arrest records? Who tends to you know, have, have, have harsher sentences brought against them in courts? And of course, those data sets are completely biased and, and they're biased towards people of color, uh, against people of color. And so you take a biased database and you feed it in. And of course, the numbers that were being spit out were more likely to grant bail to a white person and not grant bail to a person of color. Now, the companies that created this, you know, uh, insisted this was not the case. Uh, ProPublica did a whole um, 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 reveal about this stuff. But it actually raises a very interesting philosophical question about um, AI in the first place. You know, is the goal of AI to create a completely fair or neutral system? Or is the goal of AI to create a system that might be racially biased, but is less racially biased than it would be <laughs> otherwise, right? Is that progress? Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's sad that that's the case, but, but that, you know, I mean, if, if, if an AI makes a prediction with exactly the same level of racism that the judges would do, does that mean it's, it's a, a, a success? I mean, you know, it's just replay. It's doing the same thing humans would do. It's it's unfortunate that the, and and there are computer scientists who are specifically trying to address this problem and and, and weed it out of the system. So so thank you so much, uh, Ryan and TJ. Unfortunately, we have to break quickly uh, to hear from some of our underwriters. So hold your thoughts. The Montpelier Happy Hour on WBEW one hundred seven point seven will return in a moment. Thanks. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. You can also find us on Emily's YouTube channel as well as Brattleboro Community Television's channel. Welcome back, Ryan Krieger and Attorney General TJ Donovan. TJ, I know you have to leave in a couple minutes, so Let's round up and, and what are some of the things on your desk right now that you think Vermonters need to know about? Well, I, I just want to go back to this conversation about predictive analytics, and it really is it's a fascinating topic. And I just want to touch on a couple issues. And I, and I think this is an issue um, that does deal with and confront uh, our state. And I know that Emily is going to be dealing with it in the legislature. Um, we are part of Vermont as a, of a global digital economy, um, and we have to be able, and we're, and we're seeing that, frankly, during the pandemic, um, how we do business remotely, uh, the importance of, of, obviously, broadband and that infrastructure that you talk about. And I think as we talk about that economic development issue of, of engaging in that economy, how we carve out the privacy rights um, is going to be critically important. And I think Vermont can lead on. And it's not, it, it, as you see through this conversation, it's not an easy conversation to have and to, and to grapple with. But we have to, because I think consumers want privacy rights. Emily said it best. You click on the box because you have to. You're, 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 you're almost under duress because you can't engage in this economy without clicking the box. 
And I think there's real consumer protection issues with that. And I think the future of consumer protection is online and Vermont can be a leader on that. And I, and I think we have to say you can have both. And that's what I'd say what G, GDPR did. Clearly said you can have rob, a robust uh, a global digital economy and privacy rights. Because I think what we hear too often is you can't have both. You're going to have to wave and give up your privacy rights if you want to engage in this global economy. And I don't agree with that. And I would love to sort of second what you said. I think when we hear about this in when we're having a hearing and the legislature on this issue, the folks from the big tech firms come in and throw up these huge scare tactics. We like all corporations will right. run screaming from the boundaries of Vermont if you pass this law. And we saw that that didn't happen with the data broker bill. Right. And I, I just want to give a quick anecdote about the GDPR. I, I was lucky enough to uh, be part of a group that when GDPR was implemented and took effect, uh, went to look at it uh, in Ireland. Um, and I had gone to Ireland e years past and uh, Ireland struck me. There's very, there's a lot of similarities, not totally with Vermont. Historically, it's a, it was a rural country uh, that was economically challenged, if not depressed, where it's people left it's young people left for a number of reasons. And you look at the state of Vermont, we're rural, people leave our state, we struggle bringing people to this state. And we're at this point in terms of how we grow as, a, as an economy where we really haven't paved our way um, or charted a path, I think, of this global economy with the privacy and consumer protections that are so needed. Ireland in 2020, at least Dublin, Every major tech company for the EU is headquartered there. It was a bustling uh, economy uh, that was based on technology, but also had incredibly strong privacy rights. And I kept on saying, why can't we do this? Why can't we do this? And there was an alignment between industry and government and education and education, another issue we have to talk about when we talk about privacy, um, where, so I, I just look at the EU and say, I do think we can carve a, a path where we as a state engage and lead and allow people to participate in, in a global economy, uh, but also carve out people's privacy rights. It's a tough conversation, but that's the future. And, and what underlies that, and Ryan and Emily talked about this a little bit, is really a fundamental um, question. Has technology outpaced our law? And, you know, in many instances it has, of course. But I think our law, our, not only our constitutional principles, it evolves. That's the history of our country on so many different areas. This is the next challenge. And we need really smart people like Emily and Ryan to get us, get us there to figure it out because I really think it goes to, a, goes to the economic future of our state. Thank you so much uh, for that, TJ. Um, you know, Ryan and Emily and I, before, uh, during break, we were talking a little bit about um, this balance between technology and, and um, privacy. And I, I just have to quickly say, sorry if I sound a little distracted. Um, I live in an apartment building and my neighbors have a band and they have decided that they're going to practice. <laughs> So if you catch anything in the background, that's why. Um, uh, Ryan, you were saying that there's always a compelling reason to invade people's privacy. And I find that so interesting because even earlier in the show, when I was using examples as um, a journalist, you know, one of our jobs is journalism. We've got the celebrity rags who, you know, who's dating who and that type of thing, which thank goodness I don't have to do that type of journalism because um, I'd be bored. Uh, but for the most part, journalism's job is to hold people in power accountable. So like, I don't care what the average 19 year old did when they were 19, but I do care what the president did or the governor did, or even like an AG did, you know, that might talk about who they are as a, as a person in power. But, you know, TJ used the great example of what if someone's going for a job interview and when they were 19, it comes back to haunt them. You know, those are different parts of our lives. So could you talk to that a little bit, Ryan, about that balance between um, people's compelling reasons and privacy? Yeah, what, what I was saying when we're on break is that, you know, privacy 
privacy is not this this absolute, you know, this is the level of privacy that a person should have. And, you know, there's always a, a reason. Privacy is always a balance between two competing interests. OK, it is always law enforcement versus privacy or or public safety, stopping terrorists, finding the truth. If you're a journalist, having good health outcomes, there's always a good reason to invade people's privacy. And there may be you know, circumstances where that that compelling reason you know, during times of war becomes so compelling that you know, others fall away. The problem is that the person with the compelling interest to invade your privacy is always going to show up in the legislature and advocate for their compelling interest. And the person who says, now, wait a minute, what about the privacy issues often isn't in the room when the decision is being made because they're just arguing for privacy, right? This kind of amorphous notion. They don't have a profit motive. They're not trying to stop criminals. And it can be a very uncomfortable conversation when you have one side saying, look, we're trying to stop crime. We're trying to catch murderers. And if you don't let us do X, Y, or Z, if you don't let us track your geolocation everywhere, a murderer will get away or a child predator will get away, right? There's all, I mean, if we had absolute complete surveillance, we would stop a lot more crime than what we have right now. That's just a given. That's just a truism. So sometimes a privacy person finds himself in a very uncomfortable situation of saying, we're okay with a certain amount of crime not being solved. That's not something you want to find yourself arguing, but that's the exclusionary rule under the Fourth Amendment, right? I mean, that's courts say, look, if if the if the police collect evidence the wrong way, we will throw out that evidence, even if it means a criminal goes away, right? That's been policy for over a hundred years in the United States. So so we've recognized that balance. TJ, it looks like you wanted to well, say I, I'm I'm smiling and I know Emily has dealt with this. Um, and really what you're talking about from the macro level is this debate that we've had in our country that has only been amplified about security versus personal liberty. Yeah. Um, and, but I would just go back to what you talk about. If you do this, bad things will happen. The parade of horribles that we've, to use a legal phrase. Um, and I, I think we can never legislate, uh, as Emily knows, or, or even do our prosecute or not prosecute perhaps, um, out of fear. And I know Emily has dealt with this because I've seen it, that you're we're considering a bill uh, in my pillar and you hear the, the phrase, if you do this, all these terrible things are going to happen. And most of the time, it's just not true. Um, but Emily, you, I know you've experienced that. No, absolutely. And we, um, I think what is difficult is that we have a very hard time actually understanding the terrible things that are happening right now or the terrible things um, mm. that we are trying to remedy with legislation because they're often much more abstract ideas of privacy, for instance. Um, TJ, do you, I'd love to give you a graceful exit because I know you have to sign off before we're done. Um, <laughs> shall we no, say goodbye I, to you I, now? I, I, sure, I, I appreciate okay. that. I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna turn it over to Ryan. I, I think okay. what we're, looking at is certainly, and I'll let Ryan talk about it. You know, we were part of um, a group of states that sued uh, Facebook uh, as an antitrust violation um, and I, that I think is relevant to this discussion. Um, and, and I think what you're seeing, um, and it goes back to what I said earlier, uh, is this emergence um, of consumer rights um, because we have, in a blink of an eye, gone into this completely digital world. Um, and I think people are saying, wait a minute, w wait a minute, this, this company has too much power. It has too much of my data. It knows everything about me and they control too much of this marketplace. And I think you see it with other companies too. And I think you're seeing, that, and I think Vermont's been a leader in this. And I think the one issue that I want to have Ryan talk about that but another part of this, another part of this is whether or not these platforms, and I don't know the answer to this question, that we're on and frankly our children are on, is detrimental to their emotional well-being and whether or not there should be consumer protection for kids as they use this product. We do it in many different ways areas of the law. This is this look, this is a vanguard issue. Um, but I'm concerned about it. 
uh, I have kids. I know, uh, Emily, you do too. And you think about this and you say, wait a minute, is, is this good for uh, the emotional well-being of children? And should there be some sort of disclosure about using these types of, I'm calling them products? Mm-hmm. Um, and look, you want to talk about a, a fight? <laughs> that will be a fight, no doubt about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got we got to be willing to 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 carve out this space to talk about this stuff to get ahead of it uh, because it's moving so fast. And with that, I'll jump off. Emily, I want to thank you for your leadership in, in the legislature. So uh, Olga, thank you for uh, hosting this, and Ryan, keep up the great work. Thank you, TJ. Thank you, TJ. Right. So great Thanks, to have guys. you on the show. Thanks, guys. Good to see you. Bye. Um, I think it's really interesting because so much of this framework, and even when I, um, you know, I'm a been reading a lot of sci-fi especially sort of dystopian fiction for a very long time is how my father raised me and in so much of that um you know the main thread especially of our legal protections on this is about the government and a fear of government surveillance and government invasions of privacy and it's really a much sort of newer thread of science fiction and a much newer thread of our lives that it's actually manipulation um, and invasion by the private sector which is, I think, a little bit harder for people to get their heads around. Um, and so what TJ was saying about sort of, um, you know, the health implications of really like an enormous amount of science and research going into how to manipulate us and how to keep us, you know, on the treadmill and addictive behaviors. We know that, you know, the history of doing that with tobacco, um, right. but how it happens online is really interesting. And then Yeah, it's, it, it, it's fascinating when you think about you know, the Fourth Amendment and the drafters of the Constitution. I mean, when that when that document was drafted, a privacy violation meant a human being barging into your house, right? And the Fourth Amendment was 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 created because in England there were these 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 writs that the that the king issued that would give a, a, a an individual a right to go into a certain property. And they, 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 the term of the writ was for the entire uh, life of the monarch. And they were assignable. You could hand them to someone else. So, so there could be a warehouse or a person's house, and a person could just have a right to go in wherever you want. But that was privacy. One person who was a government-appointed person being able to go in. There was Telephones didn't even exist then, right? So there was no wiretapping. So the notion that a private entity would ever have the level of power of a government to be able to surveil you like that wasn't even conceivable, right? So it wasn't addressed. It wasn't, it wasn't considered when that happened. Um, and, you know, when we talk about GDPR versus, or Europe versus the U.S., a really important thing to consider is that one of the reasons why Europe has so much stronger protections is because in Europe, they consider privacy to be a human right, Whereas here we look at it as a financial issue. Now note, there was a, a, a declaration of human rights in I think 1943 that the US actually signed onto that declares privacy as a human right. But there were also some court decisions saying, well, that's not actually binding on law. So it's nice that we signed it. But if you think about the history of Europe, um, you think about the fact that there were, you know, think about the experience of East Germany, which went from being a liberal democracy to a right-wing fascist dictatorship where people were literally spying on each other, neighbors spying on neighbors, children spying on parents, and the SS everywhere. And then it became a left-wing communist dictatorship where the Stasi were spying on everyone. And then it went back to a liberal democracy. They've seen the worst case scenario of what could happen if things go completely out of control. And I think part of the issue in the United States is that people don't feel those privacy violations or or having quite as viscerally. And when you start talking about the worst case scenario, it gets kind of into tinfoil hat territory. People start saying, oh, well, you know, you know, they're tracking us. Well, they they can track. I mean, that's that we're actually we passed tinfoil hat territory like 10 years ago. Um, So that's I mean, that's it's a very different way of, of, of perceiving how it is. And, and, and remember that there are actually countries in the world right now where these worst case scenarios are in fact happening, right? In Saudi Arabia, people are being tracked. In China, people are being tracked. I mean, this isn't, this might be tinfoil hat or this might be speculative here in the United States or in parts of Europe, but the same technology is being used to really negative ends. You know, it is possible. 
Well, and it's being used to negative ends by governments in those places. And I think right. we can't quite get our head around the negative impact of this being done by the private sector here because it's a much more subtle felt experience. And so I think that's, I think that's sort of the next stage in our understanding of the negative impacts. What are the impacts of the private sector having so much control over our lives? When speaking of tinfoil hats, I think there's a really interesting dynamic here around Vermont. Um, there's been, you know, Frank Bryan did some interesting scholarship on how um, Vermont sort of economic cycles are in some levels like so many steps behind the rest of the country that we sort of like caught up before we even got forward. I explained that terribly. But essentially that um, there's, if you learn the technology of this, if you understand this issue as deeply as say a programmer or you do, Ryan, um, it gets into tinfoil hat territory. And then if you get, I love that we're talking about tinfoil hats here on the Montpelier Happy Hour. Um, and if you are a person who's just scared of computers and the internet and barely have broadband or electricity at your house, which we also have a lot of people of in Vermont, um, then it quickly gets into tinfoil hat territory. And when we talk about this in the legislature, the ability of myself and most of my colleagues to understand any of this, many of us don't, you know, can, are not the most advanced computer users. It becomes really interesting to say, are we, are we preventing the future to our detriment or are we actually in a position in Vermont where we might be able to prevent, you know, prevent something terrible that's already happened to other places? And that's what I'm trying to, I think that's an interesting dynamic that's worth naming. Yeah, and, and, it, and it's something I struggle with, you know, myself when we talk about bringing enforcement actions or things like that, because we do recognize that a lot of these technologies that have real negative implications also have very positive implications, right? Um, you know, right now, you know, contact tracing, if you think about it, you know, you know, from a certain perspective, you might say, now, wait a minute, what's going on there? The government, you know, tracking all of these people, but it's necessary to stop disease, and we've been doing it for a long time, and, and it's established. But the thing about contract tracing is there's laws around it. There are strictures, there are, are, are guideposts or, or, or guide, guardrails, so that, you know, if you are of the type of person who generally trusts the government, and that there is a, you know, a rule of law, you can say, fine, we're going to let these people trace us. We're going to let them ask us who we interacted in because we know they're using it for a very specific purpose and there are going to be consequences if they use it for a different purpose. And I think that's maybe the big issue and where, where a lot of folks, I think, on the big tech are a little bit myopic about this is that, you know, when I, when I get an incoming phone call on my iPhone and it says, you know, you know uh, number, maybe Emily Kornheiser. You know, part of me goes, okay, that's really creepy. Like, how did they, know, what, what text messages of mine or what emails of mine were they reading that they know that? And part of me is going, well, that's also very convenient. Like, yes. <laughs> that's really helpful. And if the laws were in place so that I knew that Apple or whoever was doing the right thing and couldn't misuse this information, I'd be a lot more comfortable saying, this is cool, right? I'm, I'm okay with this because I know that it does, it's not an indication of misuse, it, it's, it's just the good part of it, which is why I think that, you know, a lot of it is about transparency and just knowing that, you know, it's not being used for wrong things. So as long as we don't know how this is happening or why it's happening, what the back uses are, and this goes to another interesting thing about GDPR that we don't have. So one of the big one of the fundamental elements of GDPR is that if a company collects your data, they have to collect it for a specific purpose. And then they can't use it for they a different can't just purpose. It. Hmm? No, yeah. they can't just sort it. So something yes. we talked about during the break was that my son has an app yeah. um, that he has to use for school to track his temperature every morning right. um, for COVID. Yeah. There's a lot of questions about whether tracking temperature is even helpful in diagnosing whether right. or not someone has COVID, but that's another question. Um, right. But it's not the school's app. It's a private app that the school has somehow contracted with. And I have no idea if this company is even subject to a pretty decent yeah. body of legal protections for children in schools. And so, so think about this. So, so in that context, there are going to be people who are not going to trust that company, not going to trust the school, not going to trust the government. And they're going to maybe put in false information, 
or not put information in, and that is going to have potentially real health consequences for everybody, right? So, so the system's not working because that trust isn't there. If you knew that there was a law that said this piece of information can be used solely for this purpose and then it is going to be deleted and the consequences of them doing otherwise are severe and we know it's enforced and we've seen that some company got into huge trouble for doing it. That's not the world we live in right now. But if that were the world, you would be much more comfortable, right? You would be much more comfortable, um, you know, giving that information. Much Absolutely. like if you get on your landline, um, you in, in, the, in the olden days, right? You, you were much more comfortable just saying whatever you wanted to on the landline because you figured, you know, the only way to listen in on that would have been a wiretap. And if you were pretty confident that the police wouldn't be listening in on you, you could say whatever you wanted. You could be completely open. Now, if you go on the internet and you're writing an email to someone or putting in a search, you might be less likely to express what you really think. This is part of the thing about privacy. Private, lack of privacy changes people's behavior, whether or not they're actually spying on you or not. Just the notion that it could happen causes people to restrict their behavior to conform to what they think, you know, the right thing should be. If you disagree with what the government is doing and you want to speak out about it, you might be less likely to organize or to actually exercise your First Amendment rights because you're afraid of the consequences, whether or not those are going to happen. And that's one reason why having an actual law that gives people comfort, I think, would be to everybody's benefit, you know, except I, maybe the folks who are really profiting off the surveillance. And I'm remembering that I should say that here on the Montpelier Happy Hour, the views and opinions expressed on this show are those of the guests and the hosts and not those of the radio station. Because we all have our legal things we have to do. <laughs> yes, yes. And I normally say that my views are the views of mine alone and not that of the Attorney General, although the Attorney General was sitting here. So I think maybe I get a little more leeway this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I find what you're saying, Ryan, about how surveillance and, and lack of privacy changes people's behavior. We have just a few minutes before, at least for the radio, we have to end the show. But I want to check in with, with both Emily and Ryan and make sure, are there other things we want to touch on? Um, well, I, yes, go ahead. Well, I mean, there, there was what TJ brought up about, you know, the impacts of the, on the emotional well-being of, of children. Uh, we might, we should probably talk about Clearview a little bit, the, about yeah. that lawsuit and, and facial recognition. Um, so Let's talk about the impact on children another day, because that feels like a whole other Pandora's box. Yeah, of a I think so. Yeah. Okay, great. Yep. So what I'm going to do, just for the benefit of our listeners on WVEW 100.7 LP Brattleboro, is to just say, hey, Thank you for tuning in. The Montpelier Happy Hour will be back next Friday at 2 p.m. In the meantime, head on over to Emily's YouTube channel and you can hear the rest of our conversation with Ryan Krieger. Thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in. Back to you, Ryan and Emily. Um, one of, yeah, I just want to do a little have bit about changing. Six more minutes, so. Oh. Let's just so, hear about Clearview and say farewell. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, so Clearview AI. So let's start one area of, of privacy we haven't talked about is biometrics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so that's that's a category of data that is collected about us that is about you know immutable elements of our personal being, our, our fingerprints, our, our ocular scan, our voice patterns, but it gets more complicated. Our gait, how we walk, can tell it people about us. It blew my mind when you told me about the gate thing. I don't know why. That oh, was like what really broke it all open for me the first time I heard it, you talk about this. One. There are technologies to track how you type and how you move your mouse as a biometric. So that means that biometrics can be, can be tracked through the internet about you just by how you're typing. And now biometrics has a, a, a significant value in the field of authentication. Right, using your thumbprint to open your phone, using your facial print to open your phone. That's really good because absent that, we're dealing with passwords and things that we've found are not really good authentication and are easily stealable. So authentication is one aspect, but then on the other side, you have identification. Using biometrics to tell who a person is to eliminate someone's anonymity, basically. 
whether they want to or not. Facial recognition as a subset of biometrics is a particularly tricky one because unlike a thumbprint, which you actually need someone to put their thumb on a thumbprint scanner, they know their thumb is being scanned, right? Except in the, you know, the police procedural where someone leaves the glass in the room and they take the glass away with a tissue. Um, biometrics is, is an identifying that can be done from a distance. Wait, does that only happen on TV and not in real life? I, I, I'm not criminal, so I've, I've never had to do it. <laughs> there, there are different laws around whether or not you discard your DNA or not, but yeah, I think that's, uh, most, we'll leave it mostly to TV. <laughs> um, so so bio, uh, uh, facial recognition is something that can be used to identify you from a distance and without you knowing about it and through the internet. And so that, you know, this is some, this is an issue that has created a lot of heat and a lot of concern you have had. So in the United, in, 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 it started with, I think, San Francisco and some other cities, maybe Portland, Oregon, actually banned their municipality from using facial recognition. Um, in the most recent legislative session, uh, passed in, I think, October and signed in October, um, the uh, law enforcement in Vermont have been prohibited from using facial recognition unless they have an express uh, uh, use for it by the legislature. First nation in the country, first state in the country to pass that kind of a statewide ban. And then in August before that, the governor actually did the same thing by executive order. First state in the country to ban it by executive order. So we're really up, you know, up front on this stuff. Um, but Clearview AI is a company which has screen scraped what they claim to be 3 billion photographs, put them in a database, and these are photographs up from Facebook and LinkedIn and all over the internet, and applied a facial recognition database to them. And it appears that their initial plan was just to sell an app so that you, know, you could be walking down the street, you see somebody down the street, you have some interest in that person, you take a photo of them, and now you know who they are. And, and the way it did that, it didn't tell you their identification. It would just bring back all the photos on the internet of that person. And if one of those happened to be their LinkedIn profile or their Facebook profile, well, it's pretty easy to figure out who that person is. And then after there was a huge- The implications um, for like sexual harassment and assault and stalking on this are just like immediate, well, like terrifying to me. And, and by the way, sexual harassment, assault, stalking is a huge privacy issue. It's a huge one with data brokers, whitepages.com, Spokio. The, the, you know, this is something we talked about when we raised the data broker bill, this idea that someone might be trying to escape a bad situation, hide, change their address. But the data brokers make it impossible to do that. Consumer Reports actually has an article coming out about that in their print issue in the upcoming uh, uh, thing, I know, because I was interviewed for it. Um, so... It's um, uh, so so clear you did this. And, and here's an interesting thing. They claim to have collected all of these photos off of the public Internet. That's an interesting concept, the public Internet. And it's one that legally is a little. So the notion is if you post a photo on Facebook and you set the, the most for public, their claim is anyone can do anything they want with that photo. It's fair game. Now, some people might disagree with that. And that's something that might have to be fought through in the courts. But after some heat came down on them from journalists from the New York Times, they said, oh, no, 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 we're only, sh we're not sharing this with everybody. We're going to just share this with law enforcement and security professionals. Now, who are security professionals? That's private businesses. That could be Macy's trying to stop shoplifting. That could be a bank. Who knows? That could be, uh, you know, that could be ba um, bail bondsmen who, who like want to, you know, hunt down people who, by the way, were exposed to be using um, geolocation information that they got from the mobile phone companies earlier in the year. So this stuff is all over the place. Um, and then I've read in recent months since they've been sued, we were actually the first, uh, I, I believe, well, we were definitely the first state government to sue them. No, no other state has sued Clearview. Other governments are, are investigating them, but we were the first ones to sue them. There may have been a class action lawsuit that was brought before us because they were claimed to have violated a law in Illinois called BIPA, the Biometric Information Protection Act. Uh, Illinois has a almost unique act, which basically says you need express permission before collecting biometric information about people. Mm -hmm. And what makes BIPA a particularly interesting law is it has a penalty of $1,000 per violation for negligent violations and $5,000 for intentional violations, not I, up to $1,000, $1,000. Can I jump in for one second? Yes. I Because um, I think it's this is actually this little bit, is, it's something I want listeners to understand. So we at the 
before the COVID, but during the last session, we had a conversation about passing something similar to BIPA. Correct. We were very excited about it. And then we were going to spend the summer doing some of the deep diving hard work on BIPA so that we could come back this biennium and jump in with both feet hands, whatever yes. we do. But like many, many other things, because the legislative session never ended, we're on like a month long hypothetical break right now between biennium. <laughs> um, we really didn't, we weren't able to get the momentum and do the deep dive that we would need to do to pass this. And so just like larger context for listeners, because this is something we haven't talked about that much on the happy hour, there's a lot of stuff that would be getting done this biennium, but the summer is actually really essential prep work for right. very hard conversations. And so um, we likely will need to wait a whole other year before we can tackle this issue. And, and, and this actually gets to just, just privacy legislation in general is that there are so many different approaches that could be brought. There are so many different ways to, you know, to, 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 to you know, uh, address this issue. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of debate about, you know, which, you know, should we focus on BIPA? Should we focus on CCPA or GDPR or something entirely new? You know, who knows? Um, but anyway, we, we sued Clearview um, in, in, uh, in uh, Vermont State Court. Interestingly, a number of lawsuits have been brought in Illinois uh, and some other states. The ACLU is currently suing them in Illinois as well. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the very interesting arguments that Clearview has been making is that they uh, have a First Amendment right to do what they're doing. Um, oh, I've actually, interesting. I, I was actually reading in a, in a book recently that more civil rights Supreme Court decisions have been issued uh, expanding the civil rights of corporations than of individuals. So, you know, think about all the different decisions, Citizens United and all that saying, oh, corporations have this First Amendment right and, that for, and they have freedom of religion and all this other stuff. So it's, it's, it's very interesting, you know, so, so they're trying to expand First Amendment to say they can do this. Um, uh, and they're also making an argument on, under Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which I only mentioned because it, there's actually some mention in it of, I think the New York Times just had an article about this, um, changing that in the United States. This is a law that gives very broad legal protections to platforms like Facebook and Google. It basically says you can't sue a platform for what someone posts on your platform. And there are a lot is, of really interesting implications that are being picked up in Congress on that right now. Absolutely, yeah. And, and, and I think the state is probably, you know, preempted from <laughs> trying to change that at a legislative level. Um, but so that's being, you know, uh, addressed now. So. You know, it's a very interesting case, um, and, and, and part of what's also challenging about that or interesting is even before these laws came down about facial recognition in Vermont, no police that we knew of were using Clearview in Vermont. We we're actually the only state where no, police, no law enforcement were using Clearview, uh, just because, you know, it's kind of a thing to be proud of. And so what about argument? Yeah. I think one of the reasons that we're able to do this work is because in some ways we are like a quarter step behind the future sometimes. And so we're able to see the future over the border and say New York and say, oh no, we don't want that future. Whereas once the future has already come, it becomes much harder to sort of stop the, you know, yeah. stop what's yes. already happening. And so if law enforcement in Vermont were already using it, they might have a much more compelling case to make about why yeah. they need to keep on using it. But because and, it hasn't happened yet, we can really yeah. um, protect our citizens that way. And, and this goes to the whole balance issue is that, you know, police stations across the country have, have embraced Clearview, many of them. And because look, if you tell a police officer or a detective, this is going to help you solve a crime. That's you know, what they do. They're going to use it, right? Worse. And, yeah. and, and what's happened actually is the most recent was the LAPD was found to be using Clearview until it came to light, at which point the chief banned them from using Clearview. In a lot of places, when people have discovered that their police are using Clearview AI, they've immediately stopped doing it. Not everywhere. In a lot of police off, uh, stations in Florida, uh, it was discovered and they just kept doing it. So, you know, it, it, it actually really is a very interesting view into how people, you know, view this sort of thing. Um, but it's also been reported, and I'll just say reported because I don't know that we have, you know, just going on articles, that in Florida and some other places, police used Clearview AI to identify protesters in Black Lives Matter protests. 
So this is what we're getting at. This is why we're saying, even if you're only using it with law enforcement, which by the way, we only can trust you on that and that you're only gonna do it as long as we're paying attention to you. But even if only law enforcement were using this, it's a problem because of the civil rights implications, because this stuff is not 100% accurate, although they claim that it's more accurate. They claim it's 99.8% accurate, which we argue is so almost a ridiculous claim. Um, it also makes us trust them less. Um, and, you know, the implication is, and they claim that this is not used for final identification, that basically a police station would run a suspect's photo through this and get a bunch of photos back, and then they would go from there. But we have some indications that that's not how all police actually operate. So the idea is that a police station could use this Clearview AI product, find a, a, a potential person who, who, they're just on the internet. They don't have to be in that person's state. Right. Someone could be pulled into a dragnet just because they had a photo posted on the Internet. It's bad enough that you could be you know, falsely identified because you were walking down the street, which we know happens with 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 with, with frightening frequency. Now we're expanding it to you know, everyone in the country. And that's a very, very scary uh, notion. And that's one of the reasons why our, our office is, is looking into this. And, and our argument is we don't care if this is happening outside the borders of Vermont. It's still affecting the people of Vermont, which goes to you know, another really interesting privacy question about ownership of data, right? And, and, and do we have ownership rights over our data? And what would it mean if the legislature passed a law, which has been quite asked? I mean, you know, folks have asked, like, why don't we just say you have an ownership right in your data and you can do whatever you want with it? And, you know, it's, an, it's, it's a compelling thing and it's something people are thinking about. But then what I raise is, well, then how do you define the data? What's the difference between someone selling your data in a database and a journalist reporting on you in an article, right? And you I can't would, go to the journalist. You can't report on me because that's my data, and right? That would be a big problem. With the structure of our system right now, I might say I own my data, but I would sell it away at the little checkbox that I would click every single time I go to a new website. So I'm not even sure that that would be functionally better. And, I think yeah. that we, um, I love this conversation and I want to talk <laughs> all day. Um, you and can unfortunately, do that. Yeah. Not. Um, yeah, I was kind of waiting on, on your time, Emily. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so Ryan, thank you. I, I look forward to next summer when we can dive into this further to get something done. Yeah. With by and, and who knows, maybe we can get something done, you know, this session. I mean, I, let's, not, let's not count it out. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. I'm like already dooming myself before we start. Before we head out, I know you're short on time, Emily, but I would love, um, Ryan, if you can direct any of the folks who are still listening to any resources to help them better protect their data, to help them learn how to do that. Oh, wow. I think that's, you know, a, a kind of a longer conversation. Um, I can probably provide you some of that information. I mean, there are places you can go to try to opt out of ad tracking. There are places you can go to try to opt out of some of these data brokers. There's the do not call registry, which is, you know, a big one. Um, one of the biggest things you can do to try to protect yourself is look very carefully at the settings on your phone and on your computer. You can, you know, go to the privacy settings, you know, in like your iPhone and look at location tracking and it will tell you which apps are tracking you. And if your mapping app is tracking you, OK, but if your calculator app is tracking you, then you should say, now, wait a minute. That <laughs> doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and Apple is actually about to issue some new uh, uh, technology, which will make it very difficult for companies to track you. They'll have to be much more upfront about what they're tracking. They're getting huge pushback from Facebook and Google and all those guys. So that's gonna be a very interesting thing to, to follow and see what happens. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ryan. I want to toast to all the experts out thank there <laughs> who um, dig into this stuff and try to protect our rights as average citizens. And Thank you I for want us. to recommend this film, Coded Bias, because in addition to really helping us understand um, the implications of AI and how it's used and sort of the bias that gets coded into it, um, it, the push on this work has really been led by women and especially women of color who did not see themselves in the technology that they were working on. And so mm -hmm. it's really an interesting transformative look 
at um, technology and artificial intelligence today. So um, find it at a screen near you. Thank you. Yeah. Take care. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you.